Yep. It's working. All right. It's recording. Hey, guys. Hi. 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 Most of you know me for the four of you that probably don't. I'm Earl Colby, one of the paramedic supervisors here. I've uh, been a medic for about 10 years and an EMS for about 20, so. So welcome. Tonight we're going to talk about heat emergencies. Start of summer, it'll be a good idea. Behave. <laughs> They're being disruptive, Donnie. I don't know. So, I can. <laughs> Yeah, Donnie here in the back row. Yeah, really. So today we're just going to cover, it's going to be real brief, real simple, I hope. Really easy to get through. We're going to, you know, they understand the physiology of thermal regulation, how our body maintains the temperature. What's our basic temperature supposed to be? Yeah, 98.6, give or take a degree or two. You know, some people be a little higher, a little lower. So and there's a couple different types of heat exposures and emergencies we'll go through. You know, identify the different management for the heat emergencies that we're allowed to do in and pre hospitally <clears throat> So to start off, how does our body gain and lose heat? All right, we like that magic number of 98.6. Anything above or below that, the body starts to get a little unhappy. So out in the environment, the different ways we can lose it is convection. What's convection? Anybody tell me? So convection is heat loss due to air circulation. The breeze blows over your skin, you get the goosebumps. That's convection heat loss. Mm -hmm. Conduction. Yeah, that's the guy sitting on the rock there. Plant your butt on the rock, you get cold. The rock will suck it up. Radiation, you ever get sunburned? Mm -hmm. That's radiation heat. And evaporation, we all know that. We sweat, we get stinky. Mm -hmm. And then respiration, we lose a lot of heat through respiration. You know, um, a lot of animals, that's the only way you use them. That's why your dog pants all the time, they lose heat. When they get hot, they start panting that. <laughs> So just a couple de definitions to get through real quick. Thermoregulation is the maintenance of regulation of temperature. Or regulation, so pretty simple. So what's hyperthermia? It's right there. Just an unusually high temperature, right? Generally due to environment, that'll be due to environmental factors. They kind of leave fever, which is an elevated, unusually high temperature. That's usually due to a, a uh, infectious process. So you kind of treat them the same way initially, but then they'll do antibiotics for the infection. And there's our core temperature. So, and people can vary, it says right there, you know, a difference between one or two degrees. You know, you can normally find some people around 97, up to 99 degrees normally, so. So, how do we regulate it? The main part of the body that regulates, right, I can't talk. <laughs> I'm sure that'll happen more than once tonight. It's really funny that I'm sure the hospital listens to recordings of me all the time. <laughs> so, <clears throat> the main center for regulation of body temperature is the hypothalamus, which is that little bitty part of the brain deep inside there. It's kind of that uh, pre, what do they call that, the pre, uh, pre-civilization brain or whatever, the old brain. So. A lot of things that run that. So, and it runs a lot of that through, you know, the service of the negative feedback loop. Anybody remember that? Paramedics, nightmares from school. <laughs> so, all the negative feedback is is you get a, is it just turns something off. So, if you're shivering when you're cold, when you warm up, it turns off. That's a negative feedback loop. That's how most of this stuff runs. Not really all that important, but it's kind of, you know, so. Things that run into the hypothalamus. So you detect temperature through different sensors in the body. <clears throat> your sensors on your skin and your core, most of the ones in the core, like in your brain and your spinal column, a few in deep blood vessels, like in the neck. They'll detect changes, send it through the feedback loop system into the hypothalamus, who sends out the other signals. And there's more cold than heat receptors. So, if we get too hot, what happens? Sweat. Sweat. What? Sweat. Dehydrate. Megan, you're real, you know all this. I know I do. <laughs> so, sweating's the big one. So, body senses the heat, you get water on your skin. What's the process that takes the water off the skin? Evaporation. <laughs> evaporation. 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 And with the evaporation, you lose heat from your skin. You know, helps cool you down. Also, vasodilation. So what's the basal 
vasodilation do for us? Damn, I can't talk. Bring blood up to the skin. Yeah. And that's why you see a lot of the hot patients, they'll be, look at Megan. She's ready. She's flush. She's warm. <laughs> <laughs> that's where that flush coloring comes from. And then from there you can lose your temperature, your yeah, lose your heat through conduction, convection. Doorbell. Doorbell. <laughs> so, but then once it brings up the heat to the skin. No, I think it's locked. Oh, they brought tiny Oh, uh, hi. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Welcome. We hi. sign in here. Hi. There's a seat somewhere. Are we getting? <coughs> oh, you brought your own pen. Yes. Oh, well, she's prepared. She always is prepared. Uh, so, where are we at? So, we got the vasodilation. Your vessels dilate. Heat, uh, blood comes up closer to the skin. More blood. Heat loss through conduction, convection. You know, radiation, evaporation. Here's one of those big words, Donnie. Pylorexation. So, normally, if you look at the hair on your arm, if you get cold, your hair sticks up, right? What's that do? Your hair sticks up when you're on. Traps air. So when you get hot, your hair lays flat and it doesn't trap air to keep you warm. That's still one of those things from when our an evolutionary thing it hasn't completely left us yet. What's happening here? That's a call. Okay. I got the first one. <laughs> Oh, it's not my turn. I told it's not my fun. Why is it say so? Because it's a. That's the suicide. Okay. Thermal regulation. Yes. So back to the class. So we went through the pyrolexation, the hair laying flat to keep from trapping air. And then your body also decreased the amount of decrease your metabolism. So when you have, when your body does increase the metabolism, you get more heat generated. It makes you hotter. So that's why a lot of times in the summer you feel kind of just want to lay around. Your body's trying to slow down, cool down. Yes. Wow, Dar. Wow. <laughs> All right. So things that will affect our temp, you know, the way our body re gets rid of heat. I'm really having trouble tonight, Donnie. Those poor doctors sometimes. You shouldn't have had that wine before you came to Yeah, life. really. So. so, anyhow, environmental factors that will affect the way our body retains and gets rid of heat. You know, obviously the temperature. The hotter it is, the more heat there is to go into your body, the harder it is to get, get rid of it. Um, humidity, you know, same thing. If it's very humid, you have trouble sweating. You know, you'll sweat, but it just won't evaporate. Be less. <coughs> oh. See you guys. Be safe. Um, wind speed, you know, on days when it's really windy, it's easier to cool off. We've all experienced that, right? And the same with the sun exposure. If you're out sitting in the sun, there's all that radiant heat beaming down on you, you know, and then after a while, you end up getting burnt, which decreases the ability for your skin to lose heat. Everybody familiar with the real feel? So they talk about this a lot in the summertime, especially when it starts getting warm. So here, you know, the further across you go, the chart, the higher the temperature. And then with the humidity levels going, this one's going down. So the, as you go down, the humidity level goes up. So you can see if it's 90 degrees out at 35% humidity, you know, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, maybe. So it says 89, but if you get down into the hires, down into 70 percent humidity, 106 degrees. So where's something in our field where we could really, you know, be nice to have this? You guys are so quiet. Yeah, to know what to know what the real feel is. So say we're out working. You know, uh, I'd say probably in a closure in a closer somewhere or a barn. Well, um, yeah. So how about how about when, yeah. but to be able to <coughs> analyze this with the real field chart to have an idea where you'd have an increase in, because you can see the charts here, 
where the where it goes from yellow to the reds, that gets hotter and that's more of a danger zone. So when we're doing rehab at, a, at any type of an incident, a fire, you know, a big incident, you know, the hotter it is, obviously, the more danger it is. But the higher the humidity, even on like a 70 degree day, you know, so you can see they're 80, which is fairly comfortable for most of us. If it's low humidity, that's pretty decent to work in at most of the time. You know, even with turnout gear on, it's not too bad. But if you get down to like, you know, 80 percent humidity, then you start talking about 84, and it's high humidity, you can't get rid of the heat. Told you, we're going to move quick here. So, so the different types of heat emergencies. So now, you know, we know our body can get heat. But how does it react when we start getting hot? So the first one and the, mo and the most common, heat cramps. Everybody's had heat cramps, right? Pretty painful, hard to move around. So you get muscle, skeletal muscle cramps. They just cramp up just from being too hot. You're starting to get dehydrated. You know, salts are building up. Then we go down to heat exhaustion. That's just from exposure to high temperatures. You know, you're going to be dehydrated. And then heat stroke. And that's the heat stroke's the life-threatening one. And the big one with that is the differentiated is the altered mental status. That's the big one that differentiates between heat exhaustion and heat stroke. <coughs> All right. So heat cramps, muscle cramps. You'll have hot diaphoretic skin. You know, they could be tachycardic, most likely will be tachycardic, but chances are they'll be normal tensive. All right. So we had, um, actually I had a call the other day, it was a heat emergency, the guy wasn't tachycardic. His temp was 102.3, um, heart rate was like 60s or 70s, why do we think that was? It was an older gentleman, it was a 92 year old man, he was out in the sun for about an hour. Beta blockers? The beta blockers? Beta blockers. And we'll go through some of those different medicines that will affect this here in just a few moments. Questions on heat cramps? <coughs> then we get into heat exhaustion. So during heat exhaustion, they can have any or all of these symptoms. Okay. So and the big thing is they'll normally have a temperature less than 103. So these are an emergency, but they're not super bad. That's pretty easy to get through. So you know, they can have dizziness, nausea, <coughs> headache, tachycardia. <laughs> right. So now we're on to heat stroke. This is the real life threatening one. This is one we got to be careful of. So a heat stroke, they'll get, usually have a temperature over 104, you know, hot, dry skin, possibly flush. Altered mental status, that's the big one. Even if the temperature and other studies don't get in, if it's a heat emergency and they're altered, it's a heat stroke. <coughs> See, in the tachycardia, possible hypotension. Hypotension would be a very, very late finding. Pretty ominous with, the, with these emergencies. <coughs> so, things that can be predisposing to heat, heat problems. The elderly and the very young. Why do you think that is? We need to do exercises uh, or something. Yeah, really body, body functions don't work the way they used to. Yeah. Yeah. Wore out. Yeah. Yeah, so in, oh, you're all right, Tina. So, yeah, all the, yeah, in the elderly, you know, your functions are starting to reduce. You're starting to lose, you know, mass in your brain, you know. It happens. Things are breaking down, getting wore out. And they're very young. They just haven't developed yet. So, um, obesity. Nobody's obese, right? So, you know, that could be a factor. Alcohol use. Why is alcohol use a big deal with heat problems? That's a big impressive. Dehydration. Dehydration. It's a nerve, central nervous set, central, central nervous, nervous system, system depressant. Dang. All right. And then you know, there's a whole list of just about every medical condition, but the big ones are cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypotension, and renal disease. And that just pretty much has to do with your body being able to regulate temperature and. Ooh. There's a whole bunch of different medications and <coughs> that can do this. So, certain medication, antipsychotics. Why do you think antipsychotics are such a problem with heat problems? So, it does. So, a lot of the, a lot of the antipsychotics deal with serotonin levels, 
which is one of the main neurotransmitters in the brain and the nervous system, so, especially the brain. Um, the hypothalamus does lose, use some of it. So in paramedics, here's a big scary word from, from school again. So some of them also have anticholinergic effects. Who remembers what an anticholinergic is? Can dry up. Yeah, can dry up, um, and it blocks the effects of. Uh, yeah, God, I lost the name. What's the name of that chemical? Or anticholinergic. Acetylcholine. I did have a note. Good thing I put notes. There you go. <laughs> so acetylcholine is used in your nervous system for. So we all know how the transmitters go between the nerves cells. Sound familiar to some of you? So you have your nerve cells and it uses chemicals to transmit between the two. So acetylcholine is one of the main ones in your peripheral <laughs> nervous system and the autotomic nervous system. So if you block the effects of that, you're going to have trouble sweating, you're going to have trouble with heat regulation, uh, deals a lot with your blood vessels. So tranquilizers and antiemetics. Why would antiemetics be problematic? That's all that, isn't that also in the, the present? It can some, yeah. Yeah, some antiemetics have depressant properties. So, so diuretics, mm -hmm. you know, we all know the Lasix guy, they like to mm -hmm. urinate a lot, correct? So they can be dehydrated and then lithium. I haven't found a lot about the lithium, but it says, especially, I'm assuming from the depressant factors in the brain, you know, can lead to really high levels of the drug and dehydration, especially when they use alcohol with it. Next we're on, all right, so treatment protocols. We all love the protocol book, right? So those are the two protocol numbers. There are copies of those in the back of the, I put some in the back of the packet if you want to be able to follow along. So first we'll go over the BLS protocol. So for all levels of heat emergency, you know, it's always that assess, assess, assess. So you want to assess the mental status. Why is that so important with this? Differentiate. Differentiate. You know, if they have an altered mental status, you really want to get to it quick and get them taken care of. You know, you might have a couple minutes if they're not altered yet. So the number one thing is you do is you remove them from the hot environment. All right. So most of the time, you're just going to have one patient. You move them into the ambulance. It's shaded. It's cool. You know. <coughs> you know, if you're not there, you can go into a shaded spot like under a tree, like you're doing a big rehab at a fire scene. You know. If you don't have a tent or something there, you can move them under a shade tree. It's always a good place to start. And then remove excess clothing. So when you get somebody who has the heat exposure, remove as much as you can. My big thing is, is make sure you maintain the dignity of the patient. You know, especially if you're especially if you're outside. You know, you can start taking off shirts, shirts and stuff. You know, the ladies, make sure you keep the bras on, you know, keep underwear on, give them a sheet to cover up with. So for heat exhaustion, if you're alert and oriented and not nauseated at all, yeah, you, know, you can encourage them to drink some water, maybe some Gatorade. Usually, like with the Gatorade, it's good to mix it 50/50. Helps keep some keep them from getting too much uh, too many salts in them. You can apply cold compresses. Some of the best places is the forehead, the back of the neck. You know, if you have them laying in the ambulance, you can drape them over the axilla or in the groin. You know, anywhere you can feel a pulse is a good place to get rid of. Get rid of heat. Not the only can of worms there, but wasn't Dr. K opposed to this? What's that? The ice packs? Yeah. But a cool compress can just be a damp rag, too. Yeah, well, yeah. I thought you had issues with that. Well, you, the, the thing is, is you don't want to cool, cool people off too fast. Too fast. Or right? are you thinking uh, with cardiac arrest? No. That's cool. You know, this, was, this, was the, this was years ago, baby changed the yeah. Well, yeah, and I haven't heard that before from him. But yeah, it comes thing. right down to it, what Dr. K wants. Is it, if it isn't in the protocols, right, yeah. even if he says no, and we follow that, we're following the rule of law. <clears throat> right. So you can upset him. Oh, well, he's just got to get over it. So, but, you know, in the same token, you know, you know, and maybe he had a bad experience. Maybe years ago when he said that, maybe someone was using a <coughs> max and like threw somebody into, you know, in like a neurogenic type shock from it. Cool. You know, because yeah, that can happen. You can cool someone off too fast and really 
Yeah. Uh, throw it's like, it's like throwing, yeah. like throwing ice water on something mm -hmm. at 105 degrees. Yeah. 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 You know, you can get that, uh, yeah. is that the mammalian diving air reflex if you put it on their face, you know, they can really cause a lot of problems. <laughs> but, you know, that's like I said, at, uh, like at rehab, I like to just keep a bunch of rags and you just put them in water. Even if it's just cool water, room temperature water, you wrap it around the neck. They make a lot of friends that way. <laughs> and if it's ice cold water and you wrap it around, you make even more friends. So, and it also mentions you apply oxygen. And the big thing there is pulse ox. So, if it's less than 94, 95, give them oxygen if they think you need it. So, for heat stroke, obviously it says in there you want to call for ALS. This is a true, true emergency. I mean, you know, they're probably pretty dehydrated, could really use some high, quick hydration. You know, putting some room temperature saline in them will do a lot to cool them down. <coughs> so to cool the patient, you can douse with water, apply, apply wet towels or cold packs, next auxilla groin. Um, if you begin to shiver, slow the cooling process, obviously you're going too quick. You know, a good rule of thumb is, is um, I've read somewhere, it's like 10 to 20% of the body it is what you want to cool at a time if you're doing like that type of real heavy cooling. So like do an arm or two at a time, maybe a little bit of the core. You can just pour, pour, spritz a little bit of water on them. It'll help cool them off real quick. All right, so the ALS protocols <coughs> starts off the same. You know, assess mental status, move out of the heat, remove excess clothing. <coughs> and again, for heat cramps, encourage oral hydration. You know, using a commercial drink like Gatorade or Powerade. You know, good. You know, water's acceptable. You know, if the persistence of, if symptoms persist, or they get nauseated or, or start vomiting, you know, IV hydration. And that's one there too. Uh, did put in there, you know, contact medical man for release if they don't want to go and they're starting to turn around. You know, that's a good one. They could probably stay at home pretty safely. Heat exhaustion. Again, you know, apply cold, damp compresses. Same thing as the BLS, just the difference is being, you know, here we can have the option if, of giving a 500 bolus of saline. All right, see how that helps them out. You know, if they don't want it, again, they can get, take water in if they're able to, if they're not nauseated or not altered. And for heat stroke, like you said, this is the true, true emergency. This is the one you gotta get, get them in, gotta take care of, start the IV, you know, monitor their airways, give them oxygen if they need it, you know, whole nine yards. <coughs> Questions? They didn't tell me they were so quiet. They usually aren't. Must be you. Must be. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they I guess they all said it. Oh look, girls teach, we're gonna go, and then they saw me and they go, oh crap, we know that guy. Oh yeah. <laughs> I've heard of him. <laughs> yeah. So we're almost at the end, guys. So, yeah, told you so. We'll do a quick case study here. It's Thursday evening at the Bloomsburg Fair. Oh, boy. Gator 2 is dispatched for a female collapsed on B Avenue outside the restrooms. It's a sunny day, 85 degrees with 60% humidity, and there's a loud concert tonight for the ZZ Cup. A large crowd for the ZZ Top concert. This is a cup from a couple years ago. Right away, what would you think? <laughs> We're at the Bloom Fair, not in Sunbury. <laughs> but you know what? That, uh, something like something like that. Yeah. It, it could be. It could be, it a, could a, be. A million different things. It could be. It could be. So you arrive on scene. You find a middle-aged woman lying supine on the ground with her grown daughter with her. Patient responds to verbal, verbal stimuli, but is confused. Daughter reports that they have been there since around noon. Walking around and looking at the exhibits, patient has not eaten anything but did drink a few sodas. Daughter reports the patient is not allergic to any medications and only has a history of high blood pressure. Daughter retrieves a list of medications that reveal the Cinepril, HCTZ, and Symphostatin. What are we thinking? Lead me anywhere yet? Heat exhaustion. Heat exhaustion. Right now. Very well could be. Dehydration. Yeah. Yeah. 
besides the temperature, what would lead you to think they're dehydrated? Freaking soda in the water. Yeah, so yeah. H2C is easy. Yeah. H2C is easy as a beta blocker. No, it's my it's a diuretic. It's a diuretic. My bad. Yep. No, that's all right. No. No, that's fine, yeah. No, anything that ends in L O L. Yeah. So again, she's on the diuretic, so very good chance that she's dehydrated. So so you get her up. And you start taking vitals, blood pressure is 106 over 45, respiratory rate 24, it's shallow, heart rate 150, it's sinus, she sat 94%, skin flushed hot and dry, and temp is 103.5 tympanic, blood sugar is 109. What's your working diagnosis at this point? Why would, why would you say heat stroke versus heat exhaustion? Because uh, the skin right from really, really sweaty to hot and dry. With heat okay. stroke, you don't sweat. And what was the other what, what was the other clue? She was older. She was older. She was older. Remember in the first one, she responded to verbal, oh, responded to verbal okay. stimuli, but it's confused. Confusion. Yeah. Yeah. So that's all. <coughs> so what's your treatment plan at this point? EMTs, to, EMTs what would be a treatment plan if it's just you? Uh, cool patient, remove the excess clothing, high level of O2, and transport like crazy. <laughs> Diesel <laughs> therapy works sometimes. <laughs> Medics? IV, fluids. So. What are some things we could help do to bring down her temperature? We had the fluid, and you're saying cooling, but how would you cool her? Uh, what, what, uh, what the, yeah, remove the excess clothing. Yeah. Uh, the cool, uh, you know, the wet, wet cloths, wet towels, like you said, yeah. to like fanning, uh, to light yeah, packs, place, yeah. place it for the large, uh, large diet or uh, uh, cardiovascular uh, points yeah. are. Gotcha. Yep. Can I ask a question? Certainly. Um, I'm probably dating myself. No, never. <laughs> yeah, there was a time many, many years ago. Well, actually, you know, like decades ago for me. Did they did they actually get away from the salt and water? If you didn't have anything else, it was a teaspoon of salt per quart for a patient who who can swallow and take in fluids. Yeah. Well, and they and they said you know, and then I think it even says in the protocols you know they would prefer like a Gatorade type. Like Gatorade, Powerade, oh, something like that, which is essentially have, a salted. If you didn't have, yeah, though. but then water is just fine too. I mean, I, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, nine, so, chan so nine chances right. out of ten, you're going to have a medic there anyhow. So if they really think they're, you know, sodium depleted, they got we have sales. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's always, you know, that's always something to think about is sodium right. depletion along with the dehydration. But right, right. okay, yeah. it's usually not quite as big of an, as a deal as getting the water back in the system. Understood. All right, so we get this lady, we give her a 500 bolus of saline. Vitals are looking good, you know. Blood pressure came up a little bit. <coughs> Heart rate's coming down. She's becoming more awake and she's answering questions appropriately. Were we right on our ideas? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, it's good there. So we'll start talking about, we talked a little bit about this. So some cooling techniques, you know, we said about moving into shade, that does wonders. I mean, it gets the direct beating of the sun off of you, less chance of a sunburn. Um, move into AC, you know, hopefully every, hopefully the AC works in all your, all your trucks as you get them through the summer. It's usually about this time of year we find out they're not working. Unless it's December 31st and Megan's on the truck. <laughs> then, we, then we know that it's not working, so. Um, remove excess clothing and fanning. Fanning works good in conjunction with, you know, we all carry, you know, bottles of distilled water. You can put a, pour a little water on a fan, help cool them off quicker if you have to. You know, the cool rags. <coughs> you know, damp rags in your large vessels, you know, your neck, around the axilla of the groin. You know, I'm one, it's, we get all those big, big firemen out on the fire scenes, you know, and they, they don't need to go to rehab, they don't need nothing. All of a sudden they're walking by and they look like absolute crap. And you're like, hey, come here. No, I'm fine, I'm fine. And you just reach down in that ice water and pull out one of them rags and wrap it around their neck, they come back with you. <laughs> you know? And if nothing else, at least you're trying you're starting to help with anyhow. Mm -hmm. 
So our favorite people, right? <laughs> so you know, and then misting. You know, they're you know about 10 to 20 percent of the body surface at a time. You don't want to cool them off too fast. You don't want to make them hypothermic. So and they do drop off. They can drop pretty fast. So. Saturday or I forget if it was Saturday or Sunday we had that heat exhaustion and it was like a five minute trip into the hospital so his temp was 102.3 when we got him into the truck we had, we had got him down to just a t-shirt and his pants um, was giving him some fluid and just in the air conditioning by the time we got to the hospital in five minutes he was down to 101 so I mean you can see how quick you know sometimes turn around so you don't want to get him too chilled Right, some other cooling techniques, some of the toys. Um, yes, you, you never seen a misting fan? Yeah, they are they are really nice. Um, if I remember right, uh, the Continentals have a have the rehab trailer here in Danville. They take it all over the place. I think it's this style of fan they have. So in this jug here, you'll have the water, and it sucks it up into the fan and just puts out a real fine mist of water. Helps cool you off a lot quicker. They are wonderful. Knobles has a handful of them they put out down there. And these chairs here are really nice too. Uh, Lock Haven EMS has a couple of those on their rehab truck. They are wonderful. So, in those, in the arms there, there's a bag, and they'll fill it with ice water, and then they put another bag inside of it. And you just lay your arms down there. So you just got your arms, and as the blood circulates, it cools off. They work really well. That's the end of it. Any questions? Ideas? You know, if you're setting, if you're anywhere and you're setting up like a, a rehab site, you know, if you don't have misting fans or something, um, I used to whenever I worked at a home, we kept a couple just uh, squeeze bottles. <coughs> Get a couple of the dollar store squeeze bottles, and you can pour water in, squirt it. Works really well. Um, I can't remember the. You remember what the name of that stuff AJ Heitman always has at the seminars? It's it's some sort of a canned water, some beauty thing. He buys it at CVS. I can't remember the name of it. But it's in an aerosolized can, and he actually does a demo during his talk, <coughs> during his seminar. So he'll have it, he'll come up, and he'll have the infrared thing, and he'll show it, and you know, and you'll be 97 or whatever. He'll spray you with it, come back, and all of a sudden your skin's like 92. Yeah, I forget the name of it. It's like it's not Avion, but it's some name like that. Just a little can, it's an aerosolized can. He gets it out of the beauty section at CVS. So there's all kinds of little things out there you can do, you know, for like. That's more for like a rehab. No questions, guys? Please. Yeah, really. That was even shorter than I thought it was going to be. You talk fast. Maybe that's my favorite part. It could be. Say, so if you guys don't have any questions, I guess we're good. At the end. Thanks, all. Sorry, man. See you at the next one. Yeah, thanks for coming, guys.